Part A, helping children solve their problems themselves. Everyone knows that all children run into problems in their lives, some children more than others. By problems, I mean situations in which a child has difficulty getting his or her needs met, or situations in which the child experiences discomfort or pain. Now, most parents make the serious mistake of thinking that it is their responsibility to solve their children's problems. So they jump right in as soon as they discover the problem and start thinking up solutions to give to the child. I call that taking over ownership of the child's problem as opposed to letting the child own the problem himself. Here are some examples. A child says, I am hungry. And his mother jumps in and says, why don't you fix yourself a peanut butter sandwich? The child comes into the house crying and says, Jane won't ever do what I want to do. So we got in a fight and she went home. The parent jumps in with this solution. Now you go over to Jane's home and tell her you're sorry. Or a child complains about having a teacher who's always making kids stay after school. And the parent says, don't act up or misbehave and she'll never keep you after school. Now, if parents would only stop and think about it, they would see the advantages of raising children who learn to solve their problems on their own. Children who, over the years, take more and more responsibility for finding their own solutions to problems they encounter. Most parents would be delighted to see their children become less and less dependent on the parents more and more capable of successfully solving their own problems. Now you might be thinking that as a parent you you can't just walk away when your child is hurting or feeling troubled. Let me assure you I am not advocating neglecting, ignoring, or abandoning a child in trouble or a child who has a problem. I am suggesting however that there is a way of being a helpful, supportive, and giving parent without solving the child's problem for him. There is an alternative to either abandoning a troubled child, which nobody wants to do, or keeping the child dependent and helpless, which nobody wants to do either. The alternative is what I call a facilitator. Being a facilitator for your child a role that will require you to avoid the temptation to take over your child's problem. Instead, you try to facilitate the child's own problem-solving process. In plain language, you help your child come up with his own solution to his own problem. This way, you're being a helper, but not in the way we usually think of being a helper, which is being a solution giver. Let me illustrate some problems obviously owned by the child. A high school junior comes home and blurts out, I hate school. I can't do my homework. And I'm not interested in any of my subjects. It's a big bore. It's certainly not relevant to my life. Now, this is a problem that the child owns because hating school doesn't tangibly or concretely affect the parent. If it were my child, this problem wouldn't start me worrying about losing my job or losing my friends. This type of problem doesn't touch my life in any direct or tangible way. It's a problem he is encountering in his own life, quite independent of me. Another example. Child comes home and says, I don't have anybody to play with. A teenage girl complains, I'm not having any dates. All my girlfriends have dates, but I don't. I think it's because I'm too fat. The child is worried about her complexion. Or a child falls down and scrapes his knee and says, Oh, my knee hurts so bad, and look at the blood. All these problems are owned by the child. They are outside the life of the parent. A particular set of skills is required to help children when they own the problem. Let's call these helping skills 
or facilitative skills or counseling skills. The parent's posture is that of a sounding board, a listener, a facilitator. Your job now is to get the child talking. You want him to get all his feelings out, and you want to help him begin to problem solve. To accomplish these goals, you'll need to learn a technique called active listening. This is the identical technique that successful professional counselors use in helping other people who come to them with their problems. Most parents can learn this skill pretty quickly and begin to use it right away in the home. I'll give you a quick illustration of active listening. Remember the youngster who said, I hate school and I can't do my homework. I'm not interested in any of my subjects. It's not relevant to my life and it's boring. You would be using active listening if you responded by mirroring back or reflecting back in your own words exactly what the youngster is feeling. No more, no less. It would sound something like this. Jimmy, it seems like you're really fed up with school. You just don't feel it's very relevant to your life, so it's terribly boring for you. You can't study or find anything that interests you. And he'll undoubtedly say, yeah, that's right, feeling you really understood me. Now, this kind of mirroring back to the child, you'll discover, is a powerful communication technique. But it will take some time and a lot of practice before you feel you're doing it effectively. If you're like most people, you'll find it difficult just to listen when your child has a problem. Your tendency will be to jump in very quickly with your own solution or to tell how you handled the same problem when you were a kid. Or you may be in the habit of asking a lot of questions. Who, what, where, when, why? Another tendency of most parents is to be reassuring and encouraging. Oh, you'll feel better next year. You'll make new friends in junior high. Or other people have felt this way and gotten over it. Think of active listening as silent listening where you obviously communicate no messages out of your head, but it's silent listening plus reflecting back the message the child sent out of his head. Here are some other brief examples of a parent reflecting back or feeding back the message of a troubled child. Child crying, Jimmy took my truck away from me. Parent you sure feel bad about that. You don't like it when he does that. Child, I don't have anyone to play with since Billy went on vacation with his family. I just don't know what to do around here for fun. Parent, you miss having Billy to play with, and you're wondering what you might do to have some fun. The child might respond, yeah, I wish I could think of something. Here's another illustration. Child, boy, do I have a lousy teacher this year. I don't like her. She's an old grouch. Parent, sounds like you're really disappointed with your teacher this year. Another illustration. Child, daddy, when you were a boy, what did you like in a girl? What made you really like a girl? Dad, Sounds like you're wondering what you need to get boys to like you. Is that right? Child. Yeah. For some reason, they don't seem to like me, and I don't know why. Now, these were obviously short examples showing just one active listening response to help you learn what this communication skill sounds like. Now let me give you an illustration of a parent using active listening over, over a period of time to help a child solve a problem. In this case, the parent used several active listening responses, which, as you will hear, help the child work through the problem to a solution of his own. One morning at breakfast before she left for junior high school, my daughter, 
Judy, ask me a question. Daddy, what did you like in girls when you were a boy? The same question as I illustrated earlier. Like most fathers, I was immediately tempted to take the ball and run with it, once given such a chance to reminisce about my boyhood. Fortunately, I caught myself and came up with an active listening response. I said, Sounds like you're wondering what you need in order to get boys to like you. Is that right? Daughter, yeah. For some reason, they don't seem to like me, and I don't know why. Father, you're puzzled just why they don't seem to like you. Daughter, well, I know I don't talk very much. I'm afraid to talk in front of boys. Father, you just can't seem to open up and be relaxed and talk easily with boys. Daughter, yeah. I'm afraid I'll say something that will make me look silly to them. Father, you don't want them to think you're silly. Daughter, no. So if I'm quiet, I don't even take that risk. Father, it seems safer to be quiet. Daughter, yeah, but that doesn't get me any place, because now they must think I'm dull. Father, being quiet doesn't get you what you want either. Daughter, no. I guess you just have to take a chance. Now, how I would have muffed the chance to be helpful to my daughter Judy had I given in to the temptation to tell my daughter about my boyhood preferences and girls. Thanks to active listening, Judy took a small step forward. She acquired a new insight, the type that often leads to constructive, self-started behavior change. Most parents want to know, why should they learn active listening? What are the benefits of active listening? Well, there are a number of benefits. One, it fosters a catharsis of feelings. Children get their feelings out. Two, it helps children become less afraid of their negative feelings. Three, it promotes a deeper and warmer relationship between parent and child. Four, it facilitates problem solving by the child. Five, it influences the child to be more willing to listen to the parent when the parent is upset or troubled. Now this last benefit leads us right into part B and a new topic. How to talk to children so they'll listen. How to influence children to modify behavior that is bothering the parent. You see, up until now I've talked only about helping children when they own a problem. Now we'll switch to talking about what to say to a child whose behavior is causing you a problem. Here are just a few of the hundreds of behaviors that can cause parents problems. A child is getting too close to a valued piece of china. A child has his feet on the rungs of your new chair. A child is interrupting your conversation with a friend. A child keeps tugging at you to leave and break off your conversation with a neighbor. A child has left his toys on the living room floor. A child appears about ready to tip his milk over onto the rug. A child is demanding that you read him one more story, then another, then another, and then another. A child forgets to feed his pet. A child is not carrying his load of work around the house. A child uses your tools and leaves them in the driveway. Or a child drives your car too fast. What can you do with behaviors like these? Well, you have three alternatives. One, you can try and modify the child's environment, like buying a set of child's tools for the son who uses your tools and leaves them in the yard. Two, you can try to modify yourself, as for example, you might remind yourself that your son isn't old enough to understand the cost of tools and the value of money, in which case 
you may now feel much more accepting of his leaving the tools out rather than unaccepting of his behavior as you first were. The third alternative is to try to get the child himself to change his unacceptable behavior. 